What a wonderful beginning to the Lenten season we had on Wednesday evening. Thank you to all who made this Ash Wednesday service so wonderful, especially those who contributed to the wonderful music for that evening. I was especially struck by Winstone's reflection on Wednesday. Why might I need a clean heart and a new and right spirit, he reflected. And then he cited several scriptures that went right to the heart of the matter of our tendency to be drawn away, to be pulled away from what might really matter. Lent, the whole season, invites us to do this, this, to take a deeper contemplative look into our own souls, to examine our priorities, and to turn from what keeps us from God and good. This wilderness sojourn into the shadows of our lives and hearts can be a valuable course, I believe, for our spiritual lives. Today, the first Sunday of Lent, we take a look at the text that's really at the heart of the season of Lent itself, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Spirit, was drawn to the wilderness to face those demons, those wild beasts, those temptations that could very well interfere with his mission, that could undermine all that God was calling him to be and to do. This human dilemma, the humanity that Jesus faces, the predicament of human beings in this world begins centuries before Jesus, of course. Okay, I ask you to, if I ask you to kind of free associate with this apple, (laughs) if I ask you to name all the things that came to your mind, sooner or later, we just might hear about that temptation in the Garden of Eden and the serpent and the forbidden fruit. Few stories have shaped human thinking and assumptions about the human condition like this story has, and we all know it in some form, either from the Bible or from Milton's Paradise Lost or some combination of the two. We know the story, and we know how the story has been interpreted by the church that Adam and Eve, well, actually, some will say it was Eve who did it, but we're not going to go there this morning. (laughs) The story goes that Adam and Eve gave in to the temptation of the apple or fruit and its power. We know the story, we know the interpretations, and most of us could engage in debate about them. But I invite us to look at that story again this morning, because in a poetic, symbolic way, it tells us a bit of truth about human nature and about God. This ancient tale speaks of how we human beings can be tempted seduced by power. It warns us about those temptations and reminds us of the spiritual health, the Eden, that we sacrifice when we lose our focus and our ethical clarity and our connection with the divine. This story spotlights the truth that our enlightened, psychologically aware minds want to forget. Psychologist Carl Jung said it like this, all the old primitive sins are not dead, but are crouching at the corners of our modern hearts. Jung, of of course, calls this our shadow. So the point of this story, or a point of this story, is not that someone before us was tempted and therefore we are all forever evil, Rather, a primary message is that we human beings are created with the capacity and are confronted with the need for making moral choices. That we all struggle with tendencies to choose what is self-serving, what makes us look good, 
what brings instant gratification or attention or respect. A little bit deeper in the shadows, what might give us an advantage over another. And this story shows us that sometimes we choose the course of action, this course of action, over doing the honorable and loving thing. Temptation. The tempter, the story tells us, approaches Adam and Eve, wooing them to grasp power that is not theirs and to grasp it in a hurry without character developing experience, without wisdom. The tempter enticed them with their natural longing to be like God and this is no bad thing in itself. In fact, we're encouraged to be like God and are told that we have the potential to be. But the tempter meant something different than God meant. God meant in character. The tempter meant in instant omniscience and in power over others. It's a tempting proposition and they couldn't resist. They had taken the tree in the center, the God tree, and had made it their own in the place where truth and holiness and empowering love belonged. They placed deceit and self-seeking and competition and self-assurance. In the wilderness, Jesus is offered similarly tempting propositions. He's there in that wilderness, a place that in some ways is the antithesis of Eden, but also the scene of temptation. Jesus was here for 40 days to figure out who he was and what his life was to be about. His temptations were similar to those that wooed Adam and Eve. Command these stones to be loaves of bread. If you are the Messiah, throw yourself down from this pinnacle, for surely God will send angels to bear you up. All the kingdoms of the world will be yours if you will do what I ask. So we hear a similar sales pitch from the tempter. Grasp the power. Grasp the power for yourself. Grasp the power to do what you want to do. To claim what isn't yours for yourself. Exercise that power at will. Help yourself to it, son of God, the tempter said. Sell your soul to the empire. Turn your back on the cause of the poor and you can have it all. Jesus' temptation in the wilderness set up his life and ministry. His resistance to the tempter's offer for power and magic sets the tone for the character of his life and keeps him in relationship with that spirit who took him to the wilderness in the first place. There he resists the power of the empire that divides people into them and us, haves and have-nots. In his life he continues that as he resists the custom that relegates women and Gentiles to the margins. He resists at the very risk of his own life the proposition that some people are expendable and need to remain powerless. He opts, rather, for the power of spirit. Soul force, Martin Luther King called it. He opts for a life of sharing that power with the last and the least, rather than lording it over. We, too, experience temptation. Most of us know, I believe, what it's like to stand toe-to-toe with our own shadow, our own particular set of temptations. We know what it's like to hear that serpent's tempting offers. I usually hear it in my own voice. We hear that voice that pulls us away from self-giving love, from shared power, 
Sometimes it may seem like our only choice is between having a good life ourselves and living in a, living in a way that makes a difference for others. Sometimes, I'll speak for myself here, sometimes I allow, allow the desire for ease and self-protection to seduce me away and I miss opportunities to resist injustice that impacts others' lives. Jesus shows us how we can resist temptations that would keep us from abundant life the way that the archetypal humans in the Genesis story may not have developed yet. So with the power of the Spirit, Jesus turns from the temptation to claim power over, to assume authority rather than to relate to others in full humanity and in shared power. What is it? that tempts us away from the way of Jesus and justice and humility and hopefulness. I'm tempted to care about justice issues just a little bit more when they impact my own life. I'm tempted to live privately and dismiss the concerns that shape others' lives. Oh, I, I care about things like the minimum wage that's unlivable for some people. But I'm tempted to have less passion about this and am not moved to action. I'm tempted to demonize those whose opinions differ from my own. But mostly, I'm tempted to think that what I do doesn't matter a whole lot that I don't really have enough power to make a difference? Does my simple phone call to a senator's office really matter? What difference does it make if I ignore a sexist joke? What about my own tendencies to judge? It's in my own heart. Do I need to really resist that in the grand scheme of things? What if I spent some time in Lent's wilderness? What if I faced these temptations, if I named them head on with the clarity that that wilderness offers me? Could I resist the temptations that keep me from love and action? Jesus' resistance, after all, made all the difference. It set him on a course of redefining holiness. It set him on a course of teaching about the realm of God where all share in the power. Jesus resi resisted the temptation to serve his own interests in exchange for giving up on others. If we remember this, perhaps we can follow him in resisting injustice and wrong right on our own doorsteps. Jesus' resistance mattered. It shaped his life. Our resistance matters. It matters like his did for the sake of love and justice. My friend Elizabeth found herself in something of an untenable situation. Her own mother had disowned her and refused to speak to her. The problem was mostly that Elizabeth had rejected the fundamentalist religion of her family and community. And Elizabeth had just done the unthinkable. She had just ended an abusive marriage to which her mother responded coldly, we don't believe in divorce. Elizabeth was hurt and angry and was tempted, really tempted, to end relationship with her mother, to walk away. But Elizabeth resisted this temptation for the sake of love. She devoted herself to giving that love in, face of, in the face of rejection. So every Sunday, Elizabeth drove the hour and a half to her mother's house and rang the doorbell. Every Sunday, her mother would look out the curtains, making sure that Elizabeth saw her. And she would see Elizabeth standing there bringing flowers or food 
and she would turn away, lock the door, and ignore her daughter. Every Sunday for the 11 years until the door was finally opened and the relationship began to heal, every Sunday Elizabeth resisted the temptation to close the door and accept a broken relationship. She resisted the temptation to stop loving, to stop hoping. But she didn't. She kept loving. She kept resisting the temptation for the sake of love. When we follow Jesus by resisting temptation in what may seem like small and insignificant actions, we proclaim out loud that evil, that death, that oppression, that injustice, that unloving doesn't get the last word. When we resist our, the temptation to turn our backs on others, to look out for ourselves alone, when we resist our shadows that want to dominate our goodness, we vote with our lives for abundant life, for hope, and for the wondrous love of God. Lent calls us to examine ourselves, to look deeply and honestly enough to confront what really tempts us and to resist those temptations with the power of the Spirit for the sake of love and justice. Amen.